Briefing Keynotes. Yeah, I am John Hagen, although that's what I looked like before the white paper happened in the UK. Uh, before we get on to the much more interesting part of the panel session, I've been asked to set the scene and offer the perspective of a specialist law firm that's been in the UK market for 20 years now. Um, can I just ask, I mean, how many people are here that are either working for UK licensees or are advisors with UK interests? Is it predominantly UK, but there are, is interest from elsewhere? All right. Okay. It's not an overstatement to say that the proposed gambling law reforms in Great Britain will shape the future of online gambling in the jurisdiction for a generation. The success or otherwise of these reforms will also have a strong influence on the evolution of online gambling law and regulation in whatever jurisdiction you're in. We've seen already, listening to the session before, hearing about the whistle-to-whistle -whistle ban, hearing about advertising restrictions, gambling reviews. It's a, a well-trodden path in the UK already. We're looking at an unprecedented system of financial vulnerability screens and enhanced spending checks being introduced. We're looking at a statutory levy that's going to raise 100 million pounds a year for the prevention and treatment to reduce gambling harm. A gambling ombudsman, which is gonna deal with tens of thousands of social responsibility complaints. Modernization of the land-based industry, gambling and advertising and marketing reforms, and enhanced powers for an already powerful commission. We're going to focus today on the reforms likely to have the greatest impact on the industry as we know it. Whether or not financial checks, risk checks, will be introduced is a government decision, not the decision of the regulator. But we are all proceeding on the assumption that these reforms are going to happen. In view of legislative priorities, they've been set up in such a way that no primary legislation is required to make these changes. So we're going to example, examine how the consultation process is going so far and whether we're still on course to achieve that perfect balance of consumer freedoms and consumer protections, which every jurisdiction is looking to achieve. But in the meantime, the industry has to get on with doing the day job and we want to see how they do that whilst all of this is playing out in Whitehall and Birmingham. Financial, so I'm gonna talk about financial risk checks, the relationship between the industry and the regulator and enforcement in the UK. I'll just refresh everybody's memory on what it, memory on what it says on the white paper relating to financial risk checks. This government agrees with the principle that people should be free to spend their money how they see fit. So we propose a targeted system of financial risk checks that is proportionate to the risk of harm occurring. Assessments should start with unintrusive checks at levels of £125 net loss within a month, or if you lose £500 within a year, you're going to be subject to checks. And if necessary, to escalate to checks where there are more detailed but still frictionless, and that's a word we hear a lot in the UK at the moment, frictionless checks at higher loss levels. That's where you lose £1,000 a day or £2,000 in 90 days. Government and the Commission estimate that 3% of online gambling accounts will be affected by these enhanced checks, and only 0.3% will ever be asked to produce documents such as pay slips and bank statements. So when I hear these numbers, I don't know what you do, but I always think, well, am I going to be captured by the checks or not? And I'm, I'm not going to ask this audience whether, whether they, how much they gamble. That's a, a private matter. The government and the Gambling Commission have been very clear, however, that operators will not be mandated to implement financial risk checks until they are sure they can be delivered frictionlessly for the, and these are the key words, vast majority of customers. The Commission is going to trial this following the consultation, if that's the way we go, and the government has backed that commitment as well. So here, here are the challenges. <clears throat> there is no effective frictionless solution yet in place for enhanced checks. 
to go back to Brexit parlance, there is no oven ready solution ready to come in. And even if it were to int be introduced, the consensus amongst industry and advisors is that the friction checks will impact far greater numbers than the 0.3% estimated by the Commission and the government. Again, would you in the audience, would you consent to open banking for a gambling company to look at your bank statements? Again, I'm, I'm expecting that not as many people as you might think will agree to that. Gambling customers are experiencing problems with their gambling and they have multiple accounts. So once we have these uniform and set levels, people are going to be losing money and working their way up to known limits across a number of different operators. And until we have a single customer view, which doesn't yet exist, that's a challenge as well. We also have the challenge of the black market that we heard so much about in the last session. Developing an effective frictionless solution on a single customer view. It's not like developing a COVID, a COVID vaccine. With the respect to the industry, it does not have all the best technological minds in the world working tirelessly, internationally and urgently in harmony for the good of mankind to achieve this solution. Optimistically, it's going to be years rather than months before this is in place. And in the meantime, these reforms are due to come into place in the summer of next year. So what's going to be happening on the ground while we're still scrambling with uh, developing these solutions? That said, some important context, and for those of you that are operating in the market, will already know from compliance assessments and license reviews, the status quo is full of uncertainty, inconsistency, lack of clarity, disproportion, unreasonableness, friction. So we're not starting from a frictionless world. And many operators are going to welcome consistent thresholds to level the playing field across the industry. And be sure the government is going to, and the commission is going to use that wiggle room of vast majority of customers uh, very widely in deciding whether they go ahead with whatever is achieved in the time available. So my message to industry, and I think it's consistent with what everybody was saying on the last panel is, remain actively engaged, ensure as best you can the prag pragmatic delivery of the spirit and intent of the white paper, and hold the government to its promise that financial risk checks will be frictionless for the vast majority of customers. And when you work out what vast majority is, you should be interpreting that in the light of only expecting 0.3% of customers to be subject to friction. And work in good faith with the Commission to seek to agree workable minimum checks across the online industry. Because we heard from Abby on the last session, it was all about sustainability. We heard from Justin that it's about proactivity because industry solutions to this problem are going to be better than anything the regulator comes up with by itself. And these efforts should be happening now in tandem with the consultation process and they can evolve as we go along. There's no reason why we can't start now. The challenge is whether there is sufficient trust between the industry and the regulator to reach a successful outcome when the stakes, the financial stakes at least, are much higher for the industry than they are for the regulator. The relationship between the regulator and industry. It hasn't been very good for uh, a number of years now. And this friction, for want of a better word, hasn't served either the industry or the regulator well. But there are signs of an improving relationship. There are signs that the oil tanker, that is the relationship between industry and the regulator in the UK, is turning around. This has manifested itself, and I'll be checking with the panelists to see if they agree with that, but we're seeing more frequent and constructive engagement between regulator and industry, better communications, returns to dedicated account managers, so you can actually speak to somebody at the commission about you know, matters affecting your license, improved delivery in relation to licensing and compliance, more considered and proportionate enforcement, smarter enforcement, The permanent appointment of Andrew Rhodes as CEO of the Commission has undoubtedly been a significant factor in this improving statement, state of affairs. And industry will welcome his commitment in a speech to industry last week that a more supportive, transparent 
and grown-up relationship with the operator, where they in turn are committed to compliance and to open working with the Commission is the way forward to address the many challenges that lie ahead, technological, uh, ethical, regulatory, commercial, to achieve better outcomes for the customer and for the industry and for the regulator. And then enforcement, just a few words on enforcement before we turn to our panel session. It is business as usual in the meantime. Just four uh, trends, if you like, that I would point out under, under the, that we're seeing in the present market. There is definitely a lull in major enforcement cases. And that tallies with Andrew Rhodes' speech last week where he said that the Commission is seeing far fewer extreme cases from its casework. And for that, both the industry and the regulator are deserving of credit. Andrew Rhodes has, however, made it clear that the Commission is now focusing at the present time on operators in tiers two and three that are growing fast. Not because it's not okay to make lots of money, but their experience is that they're growing fast without investing at a similar rate in their compliance structures. So in a shameless pitch, if anybody is growing fast and in a tier two or three operator, then uh, let's have a coffee. Uh, it'll be much cheaper if we have it now rather than after you have that compliance assessment that you thought would go rather well, but then actually didn't go very well. That's a common refrain. We are seeing increased usage of special measures. I don't know if any of you have been in special measures, but as Dan said to me last night, they're almost becoming ordinary measures because they're the default way forward for less, less serious and repairable failings in a short period of time. And finally, there's a, an enhanced focus, and this should be of relevance to everybody in the room, focus on PML, personal management license accountability. If the operator fails in some way, the commission is much more likely now automatically to go after the PMLs that were in place at that time, whereas before it was a bit more random. Anyway, that's definitely enough from me.